So for this uh, video or really series, I just decided to do something a bit different. And uh, this would be really a series on Rubik's Cube, uh, more specifically uh, the mathematics behind Rubik's Cube or the mathematics uh, or the language of mathematics, which is necessary uh, to understand uh, the Rubik's Cube. Now, we'll start our discussion by talking about the history of such a cube. Now, we all know, first of all, that Rubik's Cube is really a cube and it's actually a puzzle, right? And you have uh, this cube-like structure and here we know we have six faces on this cube and every face is divided into nine uh, equal squares, right? Small squares. So it's, if I draw, it's something like this. Now, there are a total of six colors, different colors on this cube. And the goal is to basically uh, make each face of a single solid color, right? So hence we have six faces and therefore six colors. Now, uh, the history is something like uh, this, that in 1974, uh, this person named Erno Rubik, this person invented this uh, popular three-dimensional combination puzzle. And this three-dimensional combination puzzle is known as a Rubik's Cube. Now, the cube was launched to the entire world uh, in around about um, 1980, right? And as soon as it was launched and made available to the public, it immediately gained uh, quite a lot of popularity. And then since its launch, a lot of cubes have been sold uh, in hundreds of millions of cubes really have been sold to this day. And it had became uh, one of the best selling puzzles as well. Right, now, I, well, uh, a year later after it was made uh, available to the public, which would be now 1981, uh, this person uh, known as uh, David Singmaster, so this was the person and he is a very important person in this further development of the mathematics of the uh, Rubik's Cube. He essentially published uh, his notes that were called notes on the Rubik's magic cube. Now, in these notes, what he did is this, he performed, and this was the first analysis performed of the Rubik's cube. And he provided, he also provided an algorithm that would solve the Rubik's cube, right? So he developed an al algorithm that would solve the Rubik's cube. Now, one of the most important things in his paper or in his notes was his notation, right? And this notation is known as the Singmaster's notation, right? Now, uh, this rotation would describe various rotations that you can perform on this cube. And we'll discuss those uh, as we move along. Uh, well, to this day now, there are multiple, multiple uh, methods that you can use to solve uh, this Rubik's cube. Now, since the creation of uh, this Rubik's cube, it has been studied in multiple fields. And these fields even include uh, computer science. Uh, it includes engineering. And of course, it includes uh, mathematics, right? So it includes mathematics. Now, we'll be using the field of mathematics to understand the Rubik's Cube. Now, this, uh, uh, the, the idea of group theory is what it's called, is going to be used 
to understand Rubik's Cube. So there is this thing in mathematics, there is the subject of group theory. And that's what we'll see. Uh, how is this group theory essential and or applied to the study of the Rubik's Cube? All right. So, of course, now the goal of this first lecture would be to develop uh, the fundamentals of group theory. So first, in this first part of the video, we'll be more or less only talking about a group. What is a group? How do we uh, classify a group? How do we define a group, right? Now, we know that if you look back at this uh, Rubik's Cube, let me bring this uh, down. So let's put it over here. Now, if you look at this, and if you're familiar with the Rubik's Cube, you know that what you can do to this thing is you can perform uh, multiple transformations uh, to this cube. And how do you do that? You do that by rotating, right? So you can rotate uh, these faces like this, then you can rotate them like this, and so on, right? Now, these different transformations set up different configurations, right? So they set up different configurations of the cube. And then together, these transformations and configurations of this particular cube, they are going to form a subgroup, right? And that subgroup would be the subgroup of a group that's called the permutation group, right? So we have a group that is known as the permutation group. And it can, it's a group which consists the elements of uh, permutation. So how so more or less how you can uh, permute uh, an object, right? Now, uh, this permutation group is generated by, or you can say that the 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 subgroup of this cube, which it is generated by different horizontal and vertical rotations of this puzzle, right? So this is the horizontal rotation and this is the vertical rotation. So various of, uh, combinations of these uh, multiple rotations uh, is going to generate this subgroup. Now, it goes so far, group theory goes so far that uh, this group theory is going to also give you a solution to Rubik's Cube, right? And so group theory allows to examine this uh, Rubik's Cube or how the cube functions and then how those twists and turns are going to return the cube to its solved state, really. So that's the solution, right? All right, so now in this video, uh, the goal is to uh, define a group, right? So we're going to talk about groups. And so the first thing is obviously to give a definition of a group and some of its associated properties as well, right? So let's start by a group, right? Before we can even jump into the Rubik's Cube group, which is the group that... Uh, the Rubik's Cube is going to make up. We're going to start by reviewing some of the essential definitions from group theory. So we'll start by groups and here we'll be starting with our first definition and that is the definition of a group. So suppose that you have a set G, right? You have a set G and it is a set with a binary operation. We are going to call this operation star. And we have this set such that uh, that this binary operation is really that G cross G is going to give you another element from G. What that means is that if I take uh, these two elements G1 and I take another element from the group G2, note that these two elements, let me write it over here. So G1 and G2, they both belong to this group G. So these elements would map to, if I perform this binary operation, to some G1 star G2. This it means that I'm composing G1 with G2. Then I can say that G is a group, but it is a group under this binary operation star if some of the properties are satisfied. So 
I have to satisfy three properties. The first one is that suppose you have elements G1, G2, and some G3, and all these elements belong to the group G, then uh, what I can do is I can take G1, compose it with G1, uh, sorry, G, uh, let's compose it with G2, right? And then compose this thing with G3. And if that is exactly the same as composing G2 with G3 and then composing with G1, then this thing is known as associativity. And this property must be satisfied if G is a group under some operation. That's the first one. The second one is really the identity property or it's the identity element. So there has to exist an identity element. Uh, what that means is that we'll say that there exists some element which we'll call E and this E is the identity element such that A or any element from the group, suppose it's, uh, suppose it's any element G, if I compose this with the identity element, then that means that I'm composing identity with this G. So these are the same thing. And that would just give me the element G. And this is true for all G. And this property is known as the identity property. Right? So, so far we have talked about two of the properties. The final property, and if this one is satisfied, then G is a group under some operation star. And this property is really the inverse property. And it states that for all G that belongs to G that are inside the set G, there exists an inverse, so G inverse, this is the element, such that if I compose G with this inverse, then it gives me the identity element, which is also the same as composing the inverse first with the element G. And if this thing is true, then we can say that G is a group under this binary operation star. Let me give you an example, which will make things completely clear, right? And it should, because it's a very simple example. And this is very simple. Uh, these are very simple things that you don't, you think about these all the time, but you don't think of them uh, applying mathematics, but you're familiar with what a group is, right? You can, anyone can have uh, a, a more or less correct definition of a group in their head without even knowing the mathematics. Here, we're just writing things down a bit more explicitly and mathematically, right? All right, so let's uh, do an example. Suppose that I have a set G, right? G is a set, it's a group, and it's a set of integers. So at this point, I'm not going to say that it's a group. I'm just going to say that G is a set of integers. And we know that in mathematics, we denote a set of integers with this uh, funny looking Z. Now, we are also going to state that we have some elements G1, G2, and G3, and all of these elements belong to this set of integers z. What that means is we know that we have integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to so on, right? All of them are integers and we're just talk, we're just going to talk about some three numbers right now. And these belong to this z or you can say uh, the group g or the set g. And we'll say that this uh, g is a set of integers. It's a group under addition. Right? What that means is, mathematically, I can say that uh, with G, which is a set of integers, it is a group under the operation, which is addition. So before, if you remember, I wrote this definition of a group as G and some binary operation, star. Right. In this case, it's the same thing, but the set is of integers, the group is of integers, under the operation, binary operation, which is addition. Now, star has become the binary operation of addition. Now, we know that if I take, for example, so the goal is to satisfy all these three properties uh, for a set of integers now, right? So we'll do that. So the first property is that G1, G2, and G3, if they belong to the set, then G1 binary operation G2 done first, and then binary operation done with G3 is the same as if I do 
uh, the binary operation between 2, G2, and G3, and then do it with G1. So here, G are any uh, G1, G2, and G3. There are any numbers that I can pick from the set of integers. So I can pick, for example, suppose let's pick 1, 2, and 3. These are my G1, G2, and G3. All right. Now, let's add them. Let's add them in this way. Let's suppose that I do 1, binary operation, 2, binary operation, 3. So like this. So first I do this. What does that give me? That gives me 6, right? 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 plus 3 is 6. Now, suppose I do this thing. 1 plus 2 plus 3, and I do this one first. What does that give me? 3 plus 2 is 5. 5 plus 1 is 6, which essentially goes on to prove that 1 plus 2 done first plus 3 is the same as 1 plus 2 plus 3 done first, which is both equal to 6. So this property, which is the associativity, is satisfied for this set. The next property is identity, right? So the first one is satisfied. Let's talk about the next one. The next one was of an identity element. What would be the identity element of this group? We know it's very simple, right? Suppose that I have a number, suppose it's 7. What do I add to this thing to get 7 back? Obviously, 0, right? So I add 0 to 7 and I'll get 7 back. So take any other number. Suppose it's 2. What do I add to 2 to get back to 2? Obviously, 0. This 0 is the identity element, right? So we have found out the identity element of this group, which is 0. Wonderful. The last thing is to prove that for all G, there exists an inverse such that when I compose the inverse with the original element, it gives me back the identity. So let's check that for this set. That's the final thing that we have to check. And then we can prove or we can say that G is a group under addition, right? So the final thing is to check for the inverse, right? So suppose I, again, I'll start with an example. Suppose I have a number two and what I wa want to add, I want to add something to this two to get the identity element, which was zero. What will I add? I'll add minus 2 to this thing. So 2 minus 2 will give me 0. Similarly, if I have 6, what will I add to 6 to get the identity element? Identity, we have proved at 0. So I'll add minus 6 to this thing. 6 minus 6 is 0, which means that the inverse element is minus g, right? Or you can say that the inverse g, g inverse is minus g under addition, right? So we have proved associativity over here. We have proved the identity element exists, which is zero, and it's a unique identity element. It has to be unique. And we have also proved the inverse exists, which is minus small g. So g contains inverses as well, which means that then I can finally make a statement that this g, which is a set of integers, is a group under addition. And that's it, right? So that's as simple as it gets. That's how you can define a group. It's very easy, right? It's It, it almost seems as though it's, it is something that you should have been studying uh, since your kindergarten, really, right? Now, we'll talk about some uh, of the terms that we'll be using, and then we'll end the video, right? So first of all, let's talk about one of the term, and that's known as the order of a group. Now this is, this might sound fancy and all, all of that, but it's very simple. It's simple because the order of a group is defined as the total number of elements in a group. So I'm going to give you an example. Suppose that I have a group and it's a set of Suppose the identity element, some G1, G2, G3. These are the total number of elements that are in this group. So how many number of elements are there? You'll just count it. So you'll have one, two, three, four. So you have in total four elements. Now the order of the group is denoted with these two vertical lines in backwards and front of this G. This is, this is in English states order of a group which is equal to the number of elements. So the number of elements, for example, so this is just an example. In this example are one, two, three, four, right? So we have four elements in total. So the order of the group is four. And that's as simple as it is, right? Now, 
another thing that we can talk about uh, is known as the subgroup. And you, if you remember, I have already said that the Rubik's Cube group is essentially a subgroup of a more major group, which is known as the permutation group, right? Now, what is a subgroup? A subgroup comes from the understanding of a subset. So suppose that H is a subset of a set G or a group G. Now, if H is a group with the same operation as G, then H is also a subgroup. So suppose that if G is a group with the operation, suppose addition, and H is also a group under the operation addition, then we can say that H is a subgroup of G, right? Now, I'll give you an example. For example, suppose G is a group of elements identity, G1, G2, G3, G4, and suppose that's where it ends, right? Now, suppose that H is also a group, or it's a set now, which have identity, G1, G2 and no other elements, right? Now, if both of them are under the same operation, which is this addition, then I can say that H is a subgroup of G because you can see that H contains some of the elements of G. And so then we can simply say that H, if H is a subset of the group G, then if H is a group with the same operations as G, then H is a subgroup of G. Right? And that's as simple as it is. Uh, we can, I can give you another example. Suppose that G is, G is, this is an example, is a set of, uh, we can say, it's a set of integers, right? So it's again a set of integers, but modulo 6. Suppose it's that. What that means is that you take any integer, divide it by 6, and whatever the remainder is, then you have put that number in there. So mathematically, I can write this as g is equal to the set of integers and this subscript 6, which is says that it's a set of integers modulo 6. And we can write these elements. The elements would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Now, don't get lost into the detail of how did I get this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but see that if then g is a group under addition modulo 6, then the order of G, first of all, is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Six elements. So the order of G can be written as 6. And the subgroup of G would be what? The subgroup of G, suppose it's H, then that would be 0, 2, and 4. Right? So it's uh, this H, the elements in H, it, they form a group with the same operation as G. All of these, 0, 2, and 4, under addition modulo 6. Now, another thing, which is an important thing, is, uh, or more or less, we'll end this video at this uh, topic, which is the definition of a finite group. And it's something as simple as saying that the group is a finite group if the, uh, what do you call this, order of the group is less than infinity. What that means is that just saying that the order of the group is finite, then the group is finite, right? So I write that statement over here. If order of G is finite, then G is a finite group. We can have infinite groups as well. Just, uh, a rem just a note, side note, really. All right, so with that, let's end this first lecture. In the next one, I'm going to talk about the types of group. We'll have different types of groups and we'll see uh, the relevant groups that are required for you to understand in order to construct the Rubik's Cube group. And those groups would be the cyclic group. We'll talk about the generator of that cyclic group. We'll talk about permutation 
uh, group as well, and we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about something that is known as the alternating group, the factor group, and so on, right? And then we'll s somewhat shortly talk about isomorphisms as well, where we'll talk about a uh, homomorphism, what is a homomorphism, what is an isomorphism, what do we mean by uh, isomorphic groups, or, and we'll also talk about the automorphisms. And these terms, they are very, uh, you know, fancy, but the idea behind them is very simple. And then we'll be seeing how can we construct groups, and we'll move on to the more important stuff, which is known as the uh, Rubik's Cube group, where we'll talk about the sing master's notation and once we're comfortable with the sing master's notation we'll use that notation to construct the rubik's cube group